I stand amazed. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned, unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall I Gracious Father, we're, we're joyful, Lord, to be here today to celebrate you, what you've done for us, Lord, the, 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 the life that you've offered us with you forever in heaven. And we're grateful, Lord, and we thank you. And we ask you to be glorified in this place this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Well, welcome, you guys. Why don't you be seated? Welcome, everybody listening on the radio and on uh, Facebook and all that stuff. Uh, a few announcements. Uh, we're going to study partway through... Uh, Revelation chapter 5 this morning, then we're going to take a break and have communion together. Looking forward to that. And uh, uh, the men's discipleship is back on this week, Lord willing. Uh, if it's not, I'll let you know at the last minute. But uh, anyway, women's discipleship, same thing, uh, back on track on this Thursday. Uh, we've got a men's breakfast coming up at the end of the month. And then we've got the Reno Aces uh, in, towards the end of August. And that's basically we just get together and uh, we, we buy a chunk of tickets together and go watch a baseball game and eat expensive hot dogs. And so it's a lot of fun. But there's a sign up on the counter for that. And then uh, a couple things to take note of. Uh, number one is uh, uh, we vote this week. or we're, we're turning our ballots this week. And so I encourage you guys all to vote. And then uh, for those of you that need the help, uh, there's a voter guide out on the counter. And uh, actually put a lot of effort into this. Shirley did. Uh, it's hard to figure out who to vote for. It's hard to figure out who stands where on what. And the criteria that we use is uh, where do they stand with Israel? Uh, where do they stand with the right to life and the abortion issue? Uh, we look at the, uh, uh, the transgender LGBTQ stuff and marriage and to see if the candidates uh, adopt a, a biblical worldview or a secular worldview. And just because they say they're a Christian doesn't necessarily mean they adopt a biblical worldview. you got to really kind of dig into it. And so we put a bunch of names on there that we think um, give you a clue, and, and you see they're the the people that are pro-life and pro-Israel, 
and that kind of stuff. And I can't tell you how to vote, uh, but I would just tell you to vote according to biblical principles, and, uh, and God will guide you there. And then also this last week, uh, there was a baby born in our fellowship, uh, uh, Fred, Frederick Dean Folk. I'm not sure if we we'll get his picture up or not. Okay, well, anyway, he's a good-looking kid, and uh, uh, almost eight pounds, and uh, 21 inches long, and uh, Fred and Joe Folk, uh, the proud grandparents, and, uh, and, and Freddie and Bailey Folk, uh, the parents. But, uh, Father God, thank you for this new life. Uh, thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you for your faithfulness. Guide us this morning, Lord. Help us to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue to worship.
time I heard it. I told Carol, go up and get that music. She said, I don't know. Go up and get that music. I want to hear that. Well, we'll take that to Susanville. I'm all of these things. I'm broken. I'm empty. I'm just so thankful for our Lord who sees my situation and says, boy, that guy needs some help. <laughs> Probably you're in that same boat too. Here we go. Just as I am. Just as I am without one thing, but that thy blood was shed.
Gracious Father, we stand here, Lord, in, uh, in humility before you, knowing, Lord, that we, we own a debt we couldn't pay, and you, you paid a debt you didn't owe, Lord, and you, you've saved us, and we thank you for that, and we sing your praises, Lord, and we rejoice in you in our hearts, and we ask you to just guide us, help us, Lord, this morning to worship you with our lips and with our hearts and with our minds, and so guide us as you will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Hey, why don't you turn and say hello to each other real quick. Well, good morning. It's good to be with you guys. I'm, uh, I'm glad you're here. There's a lot of people that are out sick and not feeling well and uh, watching on Facebook and listening on the radio and stuff, and uh, we're grateful for that. Uh, this morning, we're going to start uh, Revelation chapter 5. Uh, we're going to get part way into it, then we'll stop and we'll have communion together. Uh, but I'd like to start off by uh, reading Revelation chapter 5 together. And so if you will, open up your Bibles to Revelation chapter 5. <clears throat> then once you get your Bible open, if you're able, uh, would you stand with me uh, in reverence for God's word as we read it together? <clears throat> Revelation chapter 5, uh, beginning now verse 1, it said, And I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seals. <coughs> and I looked and behold... And in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and, and heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain to receive power and riches, wisdom and strength, and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all, all that, therein, that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped him who's, who lives forever and ever. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for revealing yourself to us afresh. And we ask this morning, Lord, for this, this fresh revelation, this fresh understanding of who you are and what you've done. We praise your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. You guys can be seated. <clears throat> well, as we get into this, uh, this kind of last exciting part of the heavenly scene, 
as we finish off uh, chapter five, we're going to get into obviously chapter six. But chapters four and five are the beginning of the third part in the outline that we've looked at there multiple times now in Revelation chapter one, verse 19, where John is told to write the things uh, which were, uh, the things which are the church age. And now we get into the things which will be hereafter. And, uh, and these chapters describe different parts of the heavenly scene. Uh, they're really both part of the same uh, story. It almost seems like the chapter division is really not all that necessary, although it does kind of break it up into bite-sized pieces. But chapter 4 focuses on uh, the glorious throne of God and, and he who sits on it. Chapter 5 gives us a further description of the one on the throne, but adds into that now uh, the scroll or the title deed to the earth and the one who's able to take the scroll and open it, uh, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lamb of God, uh, both of whom obviously represent our Lord Jesus. Uh, the scroll is sealed with seven seals. Uh, it's about to be received by our Lord, and then the opening of those seals will begin in chapter 6. The resurrection and the rapture of the saints has already occurred. Uh, essentially, our Lord is preparing to finish the task of uh, taking possession of and purifying the world that he's already paid for. Uh, and, and it kind of answers that question, who really owns the earth? And this question is about to be answered in dramatic fashion. Uh, looking at verse 1 there in chapter 5, it says, And I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, the first part of this, and I saw, reiterates the fact that John is an eyewitness uh, to these events. Uh, in chapter 4, uh, all we see is basically light around the throne, you know, the rainbow of colors and the emerald and all that stuff. Uh, but now we actually begin to see uh, a figure, uh, a person, if you will. And I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll. And so we begin to get this, this picture, if you will, of the father. And I say sort of, because obviously he's seated on the throne. Uh, in his right hand, you see the scroll. But I think back to, uh, what Jesus told us about our, our Heavenly Father, that he is a spirit. Those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. What form does he have? Does he really have hands? You know, it, it's an anthropomorphism. It's something that a human description of something we can kind of relate to. But the point is that if we see his hand, it's because God's revealing his hand. If we see the scroll, and, and as he describes here, it's a scroll that's written on both sides, how do we know that except by revelation? Because the scroll's not unrolled yet. We can't see it on the inside. We can't see it on the outside. And so John is describing something that's already been revealed in a way, and now it's being, you know, revealed to us. And so the word scroll there uh, that's used in the New King James uh, is the word book in uh, the King James, and it's the word biblios. That's where we get our word Bible from. And, and so he's holding this scroll, this book, if you will. And is it the book of the new covenant? No. Uh, is it the Lamb's book of life? Uh, no. This is, in fact, the, the title deed to the world. And we'll see that as we go on. It's not readily apparent in the context of this verse, but it becomes apparent from a typological understanding uh, because of the prophecies of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Isaiah, and other books. But one thing I want to point out to you is that the earth is permanently God's possession by right of creation. Now, who owns it slash who controls it, okay, are, are different things at times. Uh, but the fact is that God owns the earth because he created it. In, uh, in Psalm 24, uh, the first couple of verses, we read, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, uh, the world and they that dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. We can talk about dominion. We can talk about control. Uh, those things are valid discussions. Uh, but the point is uh, that God actually owns the earth outright because he's the one uh, that made it. Second point I'd like to make is that God established with the children of Israel that the land given to each tribe was a permanent gift, a permanent possession. And while it could be sold, it could also be redeemed. Uh, redeemed for a price by the legal owner or a kinsman, basically to keep it in the family. And this is a, a, an understanding that we see woven throughout the Old Testament. Now, whenever the land was sold or forfeited, 
uh, there was always a redemption clause uh, in the contract. Essentially, what was sold was not so much the land itself, but the right to use or control that land, kind of like a lease system. Uh, and essentially, um, the control of it was uh, relinquished at times, but regained under the rights of redemption. We read about this in Leviticus chapter 25, where it says that the land shall not, uh, shall not be sold permanently, uh, for the land is mine. Uh, you are a stranger and a sojourner with me, and in all the land of your possession, you shall grant redemption of the land. If one of your brethren becomes poor and has sold some of his possessions, and if his redeeming relative comes to redeem it, then he may redeem what his brother sold. And it's the idea that uh, it's a way of balancing out uh, the, the wealth and the property within the land. Uh, again, in Isaiah chapter 54, verse 5, uh, for your maker is your husband, uh, the Lord of hosts is his name, and your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of the whole world. And so he's not only our redeemer, but he's the God of the whole world. Um, we'll talk in a couple minutes about, you know, Satan being the, quote, unquote, the God of this world, only because he's got control of it, but not necessarily possession of it. Uh, the third point I'd like to make is that just as an Israelite could sell, lose, or give away his land for a time, uh, so Adam gave Satan dominion over the earth in the Garden of Eden, but not ownership. You know, control versus ownership. In, um, <coughs> excuse me. in Genesis chapter 1, uh, verse 26, it says, uh, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the flesh, fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Uh, Genesis 128 pretty much says the same thing, that man's been given dominion over all the earth, and that means control. Uh, then later on in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, uh, Adam was placed in the garden as a kind of a custodian uh, to work it, to keep it, to have dominion over it, but he didn't own it. And so when Adam forfeited, what, what Adam forfe forfeited was dominion or control, not ownership. And, and that's important to understand. In fact, Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19, of whom a man is overcome, of the same he is brought into bondage. And so when Adam rejected God's word through his disobedience, through his rebellion, uh, he at the same time embraced the word of the enemy and placed himself under the enemy's control and dominion. And that's why the enemy has control over the earth today. Uh, later in, in Matthew's gospel, remember when, when Jesus was tempted uh, in Matthew chapter 4, uh, verses 8 and forward, it said that describes how Satan tempted Jesus with the worldly kingdoms. Uh, but, but notice that when these things were offered by Satan to Jesus, Jesus never disputed his ability to make that offer. He didn't say, no, no, that's not yours to give away. Uh, he just rejected it. But the, the point is, is that they are, in fact, uh, the enemies to, to offer to give away. Jesus refers to Satan in John chapter 14, verse 30. He, he refers to him as the prince or the ruler of this world. And it's like, well, hold it. I thought God was in charge. Oh, God is in charge. God's allowed this for a time, for a season. But right now, uh, the enemy is the ruler of this world. In fact, Paul refers to him as the same. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, he says, the God of this world has blinded their minds. And so... You wonder why you know, so much evil is rampant in our world. Well, what do you expect with who's in charge? <laughs> you know, uh, it, he, he's doing everything he can uh, to, to mess things up uh, or to, to take as many people to hell as he can before our Lord comes back. Paul writes to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. He said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against the spiritual wickedness in high places. And so the bottom line is, you don't necessarily have to own something to control it. And right now, presently, the enemy has dominion over this world, and we see the result of that. Satan being the prince of this world is why there are so many problems, and it's a shame that people seem to want to blame God for that. Uh, but it really is uh, the enemy. Uh, but this is only a temporary situation because God has, in fact, promised the world to the children of men. In uh, Psalm 115, verse 16, 
The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth is he given to the children of men. And so one day that'll be restored. Uh, and as described earlier in Leviticus, uh, a lost estate uh, in Israel could be redeemed by a kinsman uh, who had the purchase price. And, and God is the only one that can actually pay the price. And, and he has to be a kinsman, uh, and, uh, and he had to be a kinsman, which is why he became a man, uh, so that he could be our kinsman redeemer, our go well, as it says there in Hebrew. Uh, the redemption price uh, was obviously not just uh, financial. <clears throat> the, the redemption price came at the cost of our, our dear Lord. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, it says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The blood of Jesus Christ is beyond value. And I've always wondered, you know, earlier on in my faith, how could one man pay the price for all men? You know, because that one man that we're talking about is also God, fully man, fully God, the creator of all life. And because he created all life, the power of all life is in him. He's the one that could, you know, die on the cross and, and pay the price. And then, obviously, he resurrected himself, and, and aren't you glad for that? I'm glad he could pay the price, but I'm, re I'm really glad he could resurrect himself and, 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 and bring us back to life with him. But that's exactly why John the Baptist referred to him as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, uh, there in John 1.29. And so, to me, this brings uh, the importance uh, and, and the, the necessity of the virgin birth uh, back into focus. Because the Redeemer, the, the kinsman, has to be a man, number one, okay? Has to be able to pay the price. We talked about that, being fully God, he could pay that price. But he has to be a kinsman. He couldn't just be any, any person in the world. He had to be the right one. And, and he became our kinsman when he was born of the virgin. I was at a study a few weeks ago, and um, uh, it appears uh, from what we read in the Bible that the sin nature of mankind is passed on through the seed of the man as opposed to the woman. That's why Jesus could be born of a virgin and not have a sin nature because the sin nature is passed on through uh, the men. And so, um, again, uh, the Redeemer had to be a, a man, a kinsman, had to be sinless, and had to be able to pay that price. And as we read in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 21, uh, for he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so Jesus, uh, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the virgin, uh, you know, in bodily form anyway, came into this world sinless and left this world in a certain sense sinless because <clears throat> even though he took on the sin of mankind, uh, at one point he resurrected himself. And, uh, and he's the only one that could pay that price. So the price has been paid. Now it's just a matter of taking possession. Have you ever paid for something uh, on a layaway plan or, you know, you, you, you mail the money off and then you waited to take possession? If, you, if you're ordering for Amazon lately, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, you mail your money away or uh, electronically taken out of your account, but you take possession sometime later. And that's exactly what's happening here. Uh, in the parable that Jesus spoke, the kingdom parable, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, Jesus said, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, <clears throat> which a man found and hid, and for joy over it goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. And so in this parable, uh, it, it parallels what we're talking about. We see the buyer that wants the treasure, but he has to buy the whole field to get it. Uh, he then gives everything he has to pay that price. In this case, the field is the world, uh, the buyer is our Lord Jesus, and the treasure that he wants is all the believers. But he has to buy, it's a package deal. He has to buy the whole thing. So he pays the price for the whole thing, but he just gets the believers out of it. Uh, we see the same redemption typology uh, presented in, in Jeremiah, Jeremiah's prophecy in Jeremiah 25, 11, and again in uh, Jeremiah 32, 6 through 15, where Jeremiah is in prison uh, for having prophesied about the Babylonian captivity uh, he's trying to explain the sense in surrender as opposed to slaughter. Uh, <clears throat> real estate prices are dropping in Jerusalem. 
and he directs his servant to basically purchase a plot of land. Uh, he records the transaction twice, uh, once sealed, um, once not sealed. He bears the deed uh, in a clay jar uh, with the intent that his kinsman redeemer uh, will redeem the land at the end of the captivity, uh, which he's also prophesied would occur 70 years later. Uh, all this is according to the requirements that are laid out in Leviticus. And so you see the same exact kind of transaction taking place. Uh, the deed to the sale was written and sealed. Uh, a duplicate was made bearing testimony to what was recorded on the sealed copy, identifying who had the right to open the sealed copy. Uh, the transaction was not fully consummated, if you will, until the kinsman came forward to break the seals and display the official deed uh, and, and the right of ownership. Uh, in a similar way, or uh, along these lines, in Daniel, the prophecy of Daniel, the son of man, Jesus, is actually given dominion over the earth, uh, and then later he receives the title deed. In uh, Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, uh, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and, and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, uh, which shall not be destroyed. And so we see that our Lord Jesus is given that dominion that will supersede that uh, of the enemy as he takes possession again. And, and as this un unfolds in Revelation, uh, we see the deed uh, to the world, the scroll, is kept safely with its creator, being left there by the lamb who paid the price. And so here there's only one scroll, uh, but its brief message is recorded on both the inside and the outside. Uh, Roman law in the day required that uh, a will be sealed seven times. And the number seven is significant in the book of Revelation. It's not accidental. It, it shows up many, many times. Uh, there are seven churches. Uh, there are seven spirits. There are seven candlesticks, uh, seven stars, seven lamps, uh, seven seals, seven horns. Uh, seven trumpets, uh, seven bowls of judgment. It goes on, a number of sevens. And so it's, it's not an accidental thing. But the Lamb, Argoel, is about to start breaking the seals. This chapter leads up, obviously, to chapter 6 with the breaking of the seals. And it all happens in sequential order. Um, uh, this is why Jesus came as a man, uh, why he came to earth to be our Redeemer, to save us, that he could be our kinsman Redeemer, not just our Redeemer in a very general sense. Excuse me, my, uh, my cold has gotten much better, but it's still <laughs> alive and well. Uh, uh. I hate to do that on the internet, the whole world watching. But <laughs> Anyway, that brings us now to verse 2. And verse 2 says, uh, Then I saw a, a strong angel proclaiming uh, with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And so first off again, then I saw. Uh, this is John in his firsthand account, uh, personal observation, if you will. But he says, I saw a strong angel. And that the strong angel speaks of the importance, really, of the message. Now, Gabriel uh, is one of the few na uh, angels in the Bible that's actually named. Uh, Gabriel, uh, Michael, and Lucifer. But uh, <clears throat> Gabriel... Uh, is, a, is considered the messianic angel, uh, announcing the birth of Jesus and, and things to do with the Messiah. And the name Gabriel literally means strength of God. And so <clears throat> we see this strong angel, possibly Gabriel, uh, the messianic archangel, uh, making this uh, pro proclamation, if you will. And as it says there, um, proclaiming with a loud voice. To proclaim something is to speak with authority. And, and honestly, it's to speak with authority without commentary. He's just making a proclamation. This is the fact, you know, a message, if you will, uh, from God. <coughs> and what's he proclaiming? He pro proclaims with a loud voice a question. Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And it's kind of like in this room. Uh, who is worthy? And it's almost like a question to the crowd, who's worthy? Are any of you worthy? 
And, you know, we're shaking our heads, no, no, not me. But in, in heaven, the same thing's happening. As he, as he makes that proclamation, there's the multitudes of the saints, there's the angels, there's all these, these people present before the throne of God, and nobody pipes up and goes, oh, I am, I am, you know, in the back. No. It's the realization as he makes that proclamation that nobody present, apart from Jesus, is actually worthy to do what's being described. And so, in a sense, who has the power to open the book, the scroll? And as you recall, back in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, Jesus proclaims, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Again, I like that word all. It's very easy to understand. All simply means all, uh, you know, all power. You know, if you have power to, to lift five pounds of weight, it's power that you have because Jesus gave it to you. If you've got the power to move and to walk and to work or to think or anything else, it's because Jesus has given you of his power to do those things. And so who has the power, who has the ability, who is qualified to, to, to receive the scrolls, to open it and to look upon it? Jesus and Jesus alone. Uh, when the Goel, the, the kinsman redeemer, showed up uh, and was able to redeem the property, uh, he would call for the elders of the city to meet before the city gates as a witness. And, and that's kind of what Jeremiah was planning on when he bought that property and he, he had the deeds recorded, <clears throat> buried in a thing, whatever. He knew that one day one of his relatives, a kinsman, would come and redeem that property. He would, they would dig up the, 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 the thing, they would take it to the city gates, and the seals would be opened in front of witnesses. Uh, I don't understand yet why there are 24 elders, but we know that the elders were those that sat at the gate and observed these kinds of things. They were witnesses. And so that's part of the functionality of the 24 elders. And so, <clears throat> again, uh, they would, this would be brought before them there at the city gate. Um, and then uh, you would open the scroll and show your ability to meet the requirements and pay the price. Then you could purchase the property back, redeeming it, in the year of redemption, which happened every seven years. Likewise, if you were a Jew and you were sold into slavery uh, to a Jew, uh, you could remain a slave for six years, but in the seventh year, you were supposed to be set free. Uh, it was the Jewish law of redemption being set free. To me, this is even more significant because give or take about 6,000 years ago, actually a little more than that, um, mankind was sold into slavery. And so that means the 7,000th year is coming up, and <coughs> the time of redemption literally is upon us uh, pretty quick. I mean, we, we talk about the rapture and the imminency of that, and I'm, I'm always excited to talk about that, but there's another aspect of timing that is coming into play here. Uh, I, just, I, get, I just can't tell you exactly when it started to tell you when the seven years is going to be up and all that kind of stuff, but we're coming up to it, the 7,000th year. Um, and you know, uh, seven years, 7,000 years, um, Peter tells us in 2 Peter 3.8, uh, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. And so another kind of a variable to throw into the equation. Now, in, in verse 3, it says, and no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. Now, I'm thinking to myself, but John's looking at it. <laughs> so he's giving us this vision uh, of what's taking place, but basically no man is worthy uh, to open it, to take hold of it, or even to look upon it. And you think, why is that? Well, in part, because just as Romans tells us in Romans 3.10, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. You know, Jesus said, there's only one that's good, and that's my Father in heaven. And so, no man is worthy. Uh, and Roman, again, saying the same thing, basically, in, in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. None of the angelic host, good or bad, qualifies, because none of them are kinsmen to Adam. They're all created beings, yes, but they're, they're, they're part of the angelic host, whether the good or the bad. And so, they're not kinsmen to Adam. Um, and there are billions of men, uh, but none qualified because 
Number one, we're the ones being redeemed. Uh, secondly, because we're all a bunch of sinners, uh, having fallen short of the perfect holiness of God. And, and that holiness, by the way, has to be demonstrated, not imputed. And so <clears throat> the only one that could demonstrate that kind of holiness, obviously, is our Lord Jesus. So none of the saints could even look upon the scroll because none of them actually had a right to be in heaven. And when we get to heaven, we'll, we're going to be there by the grace of God, but none of us has, quote, unquote, a right to salvation or a right, you know, to be in heaven because we are saved by grace. You know, uh, Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of of his grace. Aren't you glad? You know, <clears throat> we read in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And it's the idea that, that no flesh, no flesh will glory in his presence. <coughs> That's what Paul lays out there in 1 Corinthians one twenty nine. Now we get to verse 4, and he says, so I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. And so John obviously is upset. Uh, he's weeping. Uh, and, and from his perspective, you know, he's seeing this thing unfold in front of him uh, more or less in, in, in real time. We, on the other hand, have the entirety of God's word. We have the end of the book. You know, he hasn't gotten there yet. He hasn't written it yet, whatever. And, and so we know how the story ends. But John is watching this play out, and it's like a, a tragedy, you know, in the middle of a movie, like, oh, no, all is lost. And then, and then do, 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 the Calvary comes and saves the day, you know, Jesus is the Calvary, obviously. But, you know, he's seeing this played out, and he doesn't know it ahead of time. And, <coughs> excuse me. And so John is upset that, uh, that no one is worthy uh, uh, that, that no one is worthy, that means that the world would actually continue to be controlled uh, by Satan. And if that's the case, then there would be no hope in that, uh, the result of which would become apparent to the, to, to the rest of us. So John and the rest of us are all anxious to see Jesus set things straight. Uh, in, in Romans chapter 8, verse 22, Paul writes, For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. I know my personal angst as I watch uh, politics in our country take just a real nosedive, uh, the, the condition of our world, you know, get worse and worse. I know my angst about that, and I, and I try very hard, honestly, not to get too wrapped up in it. I want to try very hard to keep my eyes on Jesus, otherwise I just go bananas. But, um, but, but apparently the rest of the, the creation, uh, the rocks, the trees, the dirt, all of creation is groaning waiting for the redemption of this world, waiting to be transformed back into what it was like uh, before the sin uh, that corrupted us. And so uh, the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. John's tears end where ours do as well, at the revelation of Jesus Christ, who was worthy. You know, you have that momentary like, oh no, what's going to happen? And then Jesus steps into uh, the scene, if you will, and, and takes away our tears. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 17, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. You know, heaven is one of those places it's, it's hard to describe. Uh, the adjectives that we could use seem to fall uh, so far short. I can't imagine a world where there's no tears, where there's no sadness. I can't imagine a world uh, where there's no death, uh, where, you know, you don't have to worry about being separated from your loved ones. Uh, you don't have to worry about if someone's going to steal your stuff or break in or say something crummy or harsh or, you know, insulting. <clears throat> Heaven is going to be something that is so beyond uh, what we know of this world, uh, it, it's really going to blow us away. You know, again, another part of the description in Revelation 21.4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there should be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither should there be any, any more pain, for the former things are passed away. It's going to be a distant, not even a memory, because I think even parts of our memory are going to be wiped clean, because we'd be thinking, oh, where's my, you know, relative, or where's this or that? There won't be any of that kind of stuff. 
But with that, <clears throat> I'm going to kind of segue into uh, communion a little bit. And the question that's kind of hanging in the air at the moment from verse 2 is who is worthy? And obviously the answer to that question is our Lord Jesus. Jesus alone is worthy not only to open the scrolls, but to be the kinsman redeemer. Uh, not the only one worthy and qualified to pay the price with his own life. Uh, in verse 5, it says, uh, But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals, meaning he is worthy. And that's exactly why John the Baptist pointed out you know, to Jesus in John 1, you know, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The virgin birth was necessary, uh, amongst other things, that because the Redeemer had to be a man, had to be a kinsman to us as men, and had to be sinless and able to pay that price. And because of he, being conceived by the Holy Spirit, he circumvented the sin nature of mankind, and Jesus grew up literally being uh, sinless in all of his conduct. And it's hard to imagine, you know, n never having a, a wicked thought, never, you know, smacking his little brother behind the head, you know, on the way by or anything like that. <clears throat> you know, he, he literally, you know, like we said in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, for he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. I can't imagine what it would be like to live that sinless life than almost like on, the, uh, on a turn of a dime to have all the sin of all humanity heaped upon you. You go from sinless to the embodiment of sin in that moment and in that moment when you become sin for the first time in all of eternity to actually be separated from the father because in Habakkuk it talks about how his eyes are too pure to look upon evil and when Jesus became sin for us the sacrifice was not just his body but in that moment uh, the, 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 the communion the closeness the relationship with God the father where there was a severing, and the Father literally turned away. And that's the sacrifice that we're here to honor this morning. In Luke's gospel, in Luke twenty two nineteen, 19, Jesus commanded his disciples, and he said, do this in remembrance of me. And that's why we seek to remember him. I want to invite the, uh, the worship team uh, to come on up as we prepare for uh, communion. <clears throat> I know it's, you guys hear this uh, every month when we have communion together, but uh, I don't want to just take it for granted. Uh, but when Paul presided over a communion service, he made it a point to give the admonition uh, to those that might be present, uh, and I would say those present this morning or watching on Facebook or whatever. Uh, he said, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of our Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat the bread and drink the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And what he's saying is, is that communion essentially is not for a non-believer, uh, those who are not born again. Uh, because how can a non-believer appreciate uh, the atoning sacrifice of Jesus? How can they appreciate the concept of a, of a, a kinsman redeemer, all those things. And, and it's not to be taken lightly. And so it's intended for believers. But, it, but he also says, you know, that, uh, but let a man examine himself and let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. <coughs> a person can examine their own heart, and their own spirit, even now. And if you realize that you're not born again, uh, you can change that. You can uh, you can acknowledge the fact that you're a sinner before our Lord. Uh, you can acknowledge his holiness and paying the price for our sins. And we can ask him to come into our life and be our Lord and be our Savior and receive communion. And so it, it's just that simple. For the believer, I believe it's a time of self-examination where we should be able to look at our lives and perhaps um, confess our sins before the Lord if we need to. It's nothing you have to do out loud in front of anybody else, but in the, in, the, in the privacy of your own heart, say, you know, Lord, I've had this attitude, or I've been messed up, or I'm doing this thing. Would you forgive me, Lord? I repent of that. 
and, and help me to have a pure heart before you. Uh, very much like what David prayed when he said, search me, O God, and know my heart. And try me and see if there's any wicked way in me and, and lead me in the way everlasting because he is faithful to do that. And if we confess our sins, uh, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so the faithfulness and the love of our God is amazing. It's overwhelming. And so maybe think about those things as we uh, hand out uh, the elements. Uh, Jerry and Jeff, would you guys come up and help me out, please? Thank you. The piece of bread that you hold in your hands uh, represents the body of our Lord Jesus <clears throat> that was broken for us. Jesus declared himself to be the bread of life. <clears throat> he said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. And he's called us to remember him by literally partaking of him. And the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together.
Again, the cup that you hold in your hands, uh, filled with grape juice, represents uh, the blood of our Lord Jesus that was shed for us. It's an amazing thing when you think about how God reveals himself. We, we read this morning how <clears throat> John observed and saw that there was a hand that held a scroll. And yet, that's a revelation that can only come from God to us. I think about the two disciples on the way to Emmaus. They walk with Jesus. They talk with Jesus. They, they heard him out. They listened to the study. And they didn't recognize who he was until... He broke the bread, and he was revealed to them in communion. And I pray that our Lord would reveal himself a little bit more in our communion with him this morning. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Someone has to pay the price, and Jesus literally intervenes and pays our price because the life of the flesh is in the blood. And he's given it to us upon the altar to make an atonement for our soul, for it's the blood that makes atonement for the soul. We're also told that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And so Jesus, Jesus had to pay that price for us. In the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant, my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's partake together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you that you are our kinsman redeemer. We thank you, Lord, that we have entered into that personal relationship with you, and we are your children, and we're grateful to you for our salvation. We're grateful to you, Lord, for your sacrifice, and we stand in awe of who you are today. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and close in worship.
Father God, we sing those words that worthy is the lamb and they are so true. And Lord, we, we see ourselves as so unworthy compared to you and your glory and your goodness. And we thank you, Lord, that in your infinite mercy and your grace and your love, you stepped down from heaven, Lord, and reached into our lives and pulled us out of the pit and saved us. And we thank you for that salvation. And we remember today, Lord, what it cost you. And we thank you, Lord, for being willing to pay that price that we couldn't pay. We glorify you, Father. We remember you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. <coughs> and keep thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee and be gracious unto thee the lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace well god bless you guys i pray that the lord continues to bless you today and reveal himself to you and and minister to you as only he can. If you need prayer for any reason, come on up. We would love to pray with you. Have a great day. We'll see you soon.